Hey gang, how's everybody doing today? I know it's been a minute since I've done a video and I'm sure a lot of you guys were relieved when I stopped, but, but here we are, coming back at it. Uh, the last time that, uh, that I was on, we were doing um, some videos for uh, battles from Monroe Doctrine and I really want to get back into that. Uh, I did do the, uh, the summer drink, summer cocktail video the other week. A couple, I guess that was actually already a month ago. Goodness, time is really flying. But I also had done, uh, a few months back, I did a video that was essentially a review of the movie The Day After. Uh, that was such a pivotal, mo pivotal movie of my childhood, and so I really kind of just wanted to share my thoughts on that. Uh, and it reminded me that I am just obsessed with these, with these World War III movies. Um, growing up, uh, if it was the end of the world, then I was very interested. Uh, and I mentioned during that one that, it, it, that this obsession kind of started by watching the Charlton Heston movie, The Omega Man, at way too young an age. But that had an impact on me. And now I'm going to contaminate the airwaves with, with my rantings on various World War III movies. Some of them you'll know, like The Day After, very popular movie. Um, some of them, like today's movie, a little bit obscure. Today's movie is World War III, starring Rock Hudson. Interesting aspect of this movie was that while it originally aired in 1982, it had a brief revival in 1985 in the morbid case of Rock Hudson being diagnosed with AIDS. So this movie had pretty much been forgotten as, as far as I could tell, but as soon as the star of the movie was diagnosed with AIDS as one of the first big celebrities uh, to contract the disease, it, it came back and was, was re-aired, and that's actually when I saw it. Uh, I remember when it came out in 82, the fact of it anyway, but I didn't actually see it until 1985. Uh, to remind everybody, well, the system that we kind of came up with with the day after was we were going to look at the geopolitical buildup, so what's the background of the story. Then we would look at the war in narrative. So. In these movies, especially the TV movies, they typically don't show a lot of the war. Uh, they explain it uh, through newscasts, through press conferences, through uh, presidential briefings, that kind of thing. Once we've talked about the war in narrative, we'll actually talk about the visuals. How was it actually depicted? And once we cover that, we'll hit the aftermath. And finally, we'll wrap it up by taking a look at some of the tropes, some of the more you know, stereotypical things that you just, you know, you have to see it. It doesn't really count as a World War III movie uh, unless it has some of these. So, uh, and, and again, if anybody has any recommendations on changing the format, adding some uh, categories, maybe taking something out because it, uh, it's just not working for you, just leave a comment below and, and, you know, we can kick that conversation off. Also, while you're here, if you could uh, give me a like, maybe subscribe to the channel, that'd be fantastic. I'm going to really try to, to drop more content, to reliably uh, drop something about every Wednesday, and uh, hopefully we can, we can keep that up. And, and I promise you, I'm going to keep trying to get better and better as we go. So, talking about World War III, the movie, 1982, the geopolitical buildup. Now, Unlike a lot of movies, this doesn't start with the geopolitical buildup. A lot of movies start with tension. Okay, uh, though they're blockading Berlin again, those pesky Reds, or, uh, you know, the uh, Americans are getting involved in Central America, and it's going to start a chain of events that ultimately leads to a war. No. In World War III, they start with the war. Uh, it really starts with a company-sized element of Soviet paratroopers invading Alaska. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about what that looked like because they did actually catch a lot of it in, uh, in the visuals. But um, that, was, that was the start. But fortunately, we are given some background kind of right after that. So you see the Soviets are coming, and then we get the background as to why. In this case, uh, the president, again played by Rock Hudson, uh, has reinitiated, reenacted the grain embargo that was originally uh, uh, created by Jimmy Carter after the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, and then it was lifted by Ronald Reagan. Well, in this movie, Rock Hudson is a president in 1987, and he reenacts the grain embargo. Now, this typically you wouldn't think of this as being the the start of war. 
But it's not that different, I would say, than what happened in World War II with Japan. Uh, the United States started an oil and scrap metal embargo against Japan, and as far as Japan could tell, that was going to end their ability to, to operate as, as an empire. And so uh, that was intolerable, and they saw that as the beginning of the end and the catalyst for war. In this case, or rather in that case, they sent uh, you know, a fleet of carriers to Pearl Harbor. In this case, they sent a company of VDV troops uh, to the Alaska oil pipeline. And, and that's really their, their goal, is to disrupt the flow of oil. Uh, and it's, it's really just a, uh, a, ga you know, a bargaining chip. They want to convince the Americans to lift the embargo. And if they do that, then we won't, they won't blow up our oil. Seems like a fair trade in the eyes of the Soviets. But that, that really is, that gets us right up into the, uh, the war in narrative. And, and that gets really interesting. There are some scenes in there uh, that, where they discuss how the war is conducted. Now again, we get the visual right off the bat, but when they start talking about sort of the, the background, what's happening, how, how is everything escalating, um, we get some interesting scenes. So the Americans are concerned about escalating things too quickly. They're really trying to, to keep everything calm. Uh, the, the generals are pushing to move to DEFCON 2. Uh, they've already moved to DEFCON 3 earlier. And the president's like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're, we're just going to stay at DEFCON 3 because we don't want to push this you know, any faster than it needs to go. Uh, well, then the, the Russians had the exact opposite plan. And so they initiate what they call uh, red flag, um, which always sounds funny to me because of our exercises in Nevada called red flag. But in this case, red flag was just a series of military operations across the globe set to ratchet up tensions and apply pressure to the Americans with the intention of forcing us to give in uh, to protect our oil, understanding that they mean business. Um, and, and the best part of that is that during Red Flag, it is reported to the president um, that a Soviet Kildon class destroyer has managed to ram a Perry class frigate. And you're like, okay, well, that's, that's something that could happen. Uh, but in the uh, writer's room, they decided to promote the Kildon to become a cruiser and the Perry to become a destroyer. And so it's like, guys, it didn't take that much, you know, reading. You know, I've got Jane's fighting ships right here. This one, 81 to 82, this one would have figured it out for you. Um, but I guess it sounds more dramatic uh, when you put the bigger ships out there. But uh, outside of that, there really isn't a lot more to the visual war, or I'm sorry, to the narrative war, uh, other than they are scrambling bombers towards the end of the conflict with the uh, Soviets sending their Tu-22s and the Americans sending B-1s into Russia. And I, I found it fascinating because with the bombers, I, I suppose it's a cinematic element to give us a clock to run against uh, because why are the bombers you know, your first strike weapon uh, in this instance? Why wouldn't it just be the ICBMs? It doesn't really matter. It does give us uh, something to watch. Oh, the bombers are almost in firing position. Um, but, but yeah, that was kind of the end of the war in narrative. Now, when we're talking about the, uh, the visual war, um, that's fantastic. They, for a, for a TV show, uh, they did a really good job depicting small unit tactics and combat in... 1982 Alaska. The, the Russian paratroopers, uh, they, they, they know where they're going and they're using snowcats to get there and it's a, it's a, it's a long, slow uh, trog through the, through the snow and ice. And the Americans, turns out to be a uh, National Guard unit, they, they figure out where the, uh, um, where the Russians are going and they head them off uh, using the mobility of their helicopters. And this is one place where the visual war really kind of takes me out of the flick, and that is because they couldn't secure uh, some UH-1 Iroquois uh, helicopters. Instead, they just used jet rangers, and it just, oh, it just looks so sad. Um, 
them uh, ar army folk flying around in uh, civilian helicopters. But hey, you know, I, I get it. A budget's a budget. You know, earlier uh, when the Soviets first invaded, they were jumping out of a uh, uh, C-130. So what are you going to do? Um, you know, <laughs> you take the stock footage you got, I guess. Um, so the Americans, because they were able to get ahead, uh, set up an ambush. And they, they ambush the, the Soviets. As the Soviets are advancing, uh, they get picked up in this ambush. And, you know, it just, it, the wheels fall off the wagon for their invasion. They do what they're supposed to do. You know, they fight, they try to fight through the ambush. Uh, but the Americans are using this, this really interesting tactic that just gives me the heebie-jeebies. Uh, they hide in these aluminum, uh, or actually uh, steel pipe tubes. And I like to call them the tubes of death. Uh, so so they're, they're taking up station in these pipes so that they can concentrate fire on the incoming Russians. And that's good and well, but as soon as the Russians know where you are, you've got no way to redeploy. You literally just sit in your death tube and wait to die. Um, and I, I don't know uh, how sound of a tactic that is, uh, but the, the commander, the, uh, the colonel that, that explains it, he, he really sells it. So... Uh, so I can see why his men uh, went ahead and, and died in their death tubes. Um, you know, the, 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 one, the one other scene that, that really got me was that uh, the, when the American, when the American captain, so he's the National Guard captain, the, the colonel is actually um, regular army. When the, uh, when the captain gets shot, uh, he actually stands for a full five seconds in a dramatic pose while two of his... Uh, comrades come and grab him and pull him, pull him away. And during none of that time do the Russians ever shoot any of the other people. Um, so presumably their plot armor just a little too thick for those AK-47 bullets. Um, so, so that uh, that really kind of gets us through the the visual war. And again, you know, for for 1982 television, I, I was I was pretty happy with it. I thought they they did a pretty good job. Um, and so, so with that, we'll talk about the aftermath. Well, there really isn't any aftermath. Um, like a lot of shows, um, it doesn't, it just ends with, uh, with this just, it's, it's just horrendous. Um, there is, the, the way they depict the end of the world is to show people all over the world. I mean, you have full representation of 1982 planetary society out there living their best lives. You've got the Chinese, you've got Russians, you've got Americans, you've got uh, you know, Central Americans, South Americans. I didn't see any Canadians, but I bet they were in there. Um, and they're, everybody's just having their best lives, and in the background you just hear uh, jet engines you know, to, to represent the bombers or possibly the, the missiles. Uh, until then it starts to kind of get to a screeching sound and it's it's insufferable man um, I have a real hard time getting through to the end uh, of that without just going ooh stop or at least muting the damn thing um, okay so let's talk tropes this might be my favorite favorite part of these uh, reviews um, the very first one is the the traitor amongst us in the beginning of the show in order to get the uh, VDV troops into Alaska, they have to shut down a radar station. And so what they do is they have a Soviet agent who happens to work in the radar station uh, start taking out the, uh, the people that are in there. Now this is actually also one of the biggest disappointments of mine because the first guy to die is this guy. Does that guy look familiar? That's right. That's Everybody's third favorite Viper pilot from the original Battlestar Galactica, uh, Herbert Jefferson Jr. Um, you know, I saw him when I first saw him on there. I'm like, all right, Boomer's going to be in this show. Yeah, don't get attached. Um, Boomer's gone, and uh, and the traitor amongst us has has opened the uh, opened the door. Uh, now, the next trope, and this one is one of my personal favorites because <laughs> as an enlisted man in the, uh, in the military, I, I can deeply respect this particular trope, which is incompetent leadership. So in this case, uh, the colonel is infallible. Now, the general above him, his, his commanding officer, is clueless, doesn't know what's going on, absolute mess. 
seems only interested in, in political gain, but the colonel, oh, he is just, a, he's a hardworking man who's been passed over for promotion because he's just not political enough. And my God, look at this man's hair. He's got perfect 1982 hair. Now, it's not in regs, mind you, but that's beautiful. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that that mustache was nominated for uh, an Emmy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Um, so, so mm, don't worry about leadership. We, you know, the, the, the top might be out, but the colonel, he knows what's going on. We did get a guy, we were very lucky, in one of the, in one of the battle scenes, a, uh, an American soldier gets to ride out of the battlefield on the skid of one of those jet rangers, which, which I always like to see that. I feel like in 1980s television that the stuntmen were just lining up to get that shot. Um, it's kind of one of those T.J. Hooker shots that you just got to get it when you get the opportunity. Um, there's a, there's a scene here where the Soviet general, or I'm sorry, not a Soviet general, but a Soviet officer, uh, the colonel that's, that's leading the uh, company, which I know is a little weird, um, but the colonel that's leading the Soviet uh, paratroopers questions orders, and the uh, Soviet government immediately threatens his family, um, which is tropey, but also eh, probably kind of true. Um, and, and I think the last one is, is hubris, Soviet hubris. The, the Soviets believe in every step of the way that their plan is working phenomenally. No matter what comes in, no matter what evidence to the contrary is presented, they just believe, hey, this is going to work. Yeah, there's no way this is going to work. Uh, this isn't going to work uh, until the very end when, when they decide that, oh, this didn't work. Uh, I guess we need to initiate a first strike. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, that was uh, that was kind of that was kind of tough. Uh, final thoughts on on the World War Three 1982 movie. Um, I really I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, you kind of got to get past some of the fact that it's a 1982 made-for-TV movie. But if you're interested in the Cold War, if you're interested in you know the U.S.-Soviet relations. You know, have a go at it. If you if you get on, you can uh, you can look on the Internet Archive. They have a copy of it. If you just put in Google Internet Archive World War Three 1982, um, you can stream it online. Um, it's not very high quality stream, but you know what are you looking for? It's a 1982 TV movie. You want some HD? Get it in 4K. Um, but no, that's uh, that that's that movie and and. If you have any movies that you want me to, to massacre and butcher like this, if you're a glutton for punishment, uh, leave, a, leave a comment and, and I'll take a look. And again, I'll keep trying to get better at these and hopefully next week we'll be back with, uh, with some Monroe Doctrine. Um, so I'm looking forward to it and hopefully I'll see you then. Thanks.